Okay. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, put hands up, and uh, we will give you the chance. Uh, so we'll start the session with uh, going through uh, some questions uh, for all the panelists. Uh, so can you define your role in your organizations, what kind of uh, stuff you are doing uh, in order to champion the security changes, or security architecture within your organization? So we'll start with Manoj. Uh, so I actually lead the API and the tools engineering team. Uh, my primary responsibility is writing applications, RESTful APIs that our product uses. Um, so obviously the APIs has to be secure. You know, uh, that's one of the key things. We have our own security team, engineering security team, uh, who watches for vulnerability as far as it. Uh, but we try to enforce all these practices, security practices. You know, uh, when we start building RESTful APIs, how do you authenticate APIs? How do you scale APIs? Those are the challenges, constant day-to-day -day challenges that we deal with. In addition, I also have the responsibility of managing the IES for all our customer partner. Uh, that's a use case you saw, actually. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I'm responsible for a team of integration consultants. Uh, well, for us, integration goes uh, in the dimensions that uh, WSO2 uh, defines them, and that includes identity management. So a few guys are involved in identity management. Most guys are uh, co involved in a number of domains and combine a number of things. Uh, and on the other side, I have a number of customers. I do mainly security tasks, so, so uh, security governments. Uh, and well, in Europe, it's a big thing at this point, the whole privacy law thing, where uh, a, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of guidance is needed. Uh, so uh, that's what I do. Um. I own product engineering team, so we are a group develop software. Uh, so love to build software and, and make it available for our clients to use. I think the other bigger role I play is being an evangelist in the, in the, in the company itself. Um, as, as you saw, we have a lot of business units, a lot of uh, other groups that could use the same system that we are developing. Um, so getting the digital transformation and, and getting that, that connected customer service or customer experience for our, for our clients, uh, we need to be all using something similar and not having siloed products. So that's really, I think, why value add is, if I will. Uh, once I develop something, and, you know, show that, showcase that to others and see if they can adapt it and, and, and move forward with it. Yeah, uh, so I'm leading the security architecture at WSO2. Uh, so basically, I and we all at WSO2 play two different roles. Uh, so one is to uh, build the infrastructure or set of products to help our customers to achieve their goals in digital transformation. And then again, uh, doing the same within the company. So internally, we use set of our products. And uh, so those things like uh, would help to improve the developer productivity internally and make our employees happy. So those are the two roles uh, we play within WSO2 itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, uh, we'll start with Manoj. Uh, my question is, uh, so the cloud computing is considered one of the riskier factor. Even yesterday's uh, keynote from Jason, he mentioned about uh, he prefers cloud because it is high security, but then again, there was a question about uh, the, the uh, differences between high security versus the perceived security nature of the cloud, right? So you guys are in the SaaS business. When you go to, uh, when you reach customers, uh, how kind of reaction you are getting from the customer, uh, specific about the cloud and the security? Yeah, so in terms of cloud, I mean, there are different types of cloud, right? Uh, there's a pure public cloud, which is more of an AWS play. There is a hybrid cloud, right? A lot of people want some sort of cloud in their on-prem too, you know? Because there are sort of sensitive information. You don't want to put everything on AWS and then, you know, to take data out of AWS so much, some of it is so proprietary, right? So there's a hybrid cloud. We support both those models, actually. As a company also, we believe that at some point, the public uh, cloud will converge more into a hybrid cloud scenario, where people need the flexibility of moving the workload within their data center and the public cloud. Uh, I, that is where I think the true value is, I think, you know? Uh, uh, we ourselves, uh, today we do a lot of on-prem. We have not done a lot of uh, cloud deployment, as say, uh, something we are looking into the future, but we believe, um, not to directly compete with AWS or anything, but uh, we believe hybrid is 
uh, hybrid has a lot more say, basically, you know, where a customer want to really DR their things, bring workloads in and out of uh, two environments. I think that's where the future is, not necessarily purely public cloud per se, you know. Yeah. Okay. Stefan, you represent uh, European uh, customers here, right? And you uh, work with many customers, especially in the Europe region. What's their reaction to cloud adaptation and uh, perceived security? Well, uh, I think um, we're a bit slower on uh, than, than I think US, US market uh, when it comes to adoption, so it uh, has some delay. Uh, last couple of years, uh, I think it's, 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 going, it's going pretty well. But uh, what it's more or less what, what my colleague here said is uh, one thing that is a very, very big concern, especially on uh, personal data and you know, nowadays in the definition of the new European law, uh, practically everything is, is personal data. Uh, well, there's a lot of insecurity uh, created uh, in, uh, in, in our customers and we have a lot of governmental customers and they frankly get the message, don't do public cloud all this information is, is vital uh, on, on citizens and don't put them in. in, in, in. And uh, we, well, if, if there, for instance, uh, I'm working on a, as a security consultant on, on, a, on a project. They chose against uh, an American hosting company and, and chose for us as a hosting company uh, for, a, for a cloud offering just because of that. So that is something, uh, it will take some time until well, the the position of the the regulators and the and the and the uh, well and the, uh, is is clear on cloud. Um, so, for anything that is common common systems and, and and like mail systems and stuff like that, no no problem. Uh -huh. Whether it comes down to sensitive data on personal data, well, that it's going to be a few tough years until uh, until the the, 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 seat, the scene is settled. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pranav, uh, so I have a different question for you. So in West Interactive, uh, you are working closely with uh, many customers on the IVR solutions and so on. I guess you guys are getting like 64 million customers per mm -hmm. month into the site. Um, so that is lots of identity you had to deal with uh, uh, in order to support those customers. So what kind of uh, challenges, especially on the security area which you are facing, uh, when you bring this many customers into the sites? Um, <clears throat> well, so, uh, you know, being part of a bigger organization, the biggest challenge is, is uh, everybody siloed. Uh, so how to bring them together is one of the biggest internal challenges that we face. Uh, over the time, we have developed so many technologies or used so many technologies that um, uh, we need to get rid of them and start moving towards more, more uh, newer technologies. Um, now, you know, I'm of the belief, you know, the moment you write a code and put it in the production, it's already a technical debt, right? So you need to constantly be innovative and going into, into adapting new technologies and making, uh, making sure it's available for our customers. Um, uh, the bigger other things are, are um, compliance. Um, you know, PCI, HIPAA, all, all the compliances are forcing us to be in a, operating in a certain manner. Um, going a little bit on, on the hybrid cloud and, 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 and what Sifan and, and Manoj mentioned, uh, it, it is hard for a you know, company to suddenly say, I'm going to um, now move to cloud. Um, I, cloud possibly might be doing better standards and supporting better compliances or, or moving towards that. However, the customers of ours may not be that, that uh, comfortable doing it that way. Um, so those are some of the challenges we need to overtake. Um, we do, and from an infrastructure perspective, uh, have invested a lot into uh, data centers. So it also the the uh, the question of do we, uh, you know, the investment we have we made uh, in in our own data centers in the cloud, uh, should we take it and, and move it into the public cloud? So. Um, those are some challenges we have to face, uh, and it, it is application dependent, uh, honestly. Uh, some applications work great and, and will be easy to migrate over to the cloud, and we'll be happy to do that. Okay, uh, so I have the next question as well, uh, which is when this many customers are coming, are they demanding to bring their own social identities, or whether you see any uh, issues in uh, allowing social identities to be used within uh, your applications? Um, 
I think the best client is, is different. Uh, so far, at least for interactive services, uh, we are not seeing a lot of that. Uh, and just because it's, it's, it's a different market. Uh, we are really not dealing with the actual end consumers of, of our products, right? We are dealing with the clients and, and, and the employees of the clients, but not necessarily the, the consumers that the clients serve. Uh, so that has been a, a less of a, a thing. However, uh, as far as uh, getting internally uh, some of those identities available, and, and, and for the employees, when I mean that, uh, by, by which I mean, um, those is, is getting prevalent, and people want to start using uh, some of those uh, social identities as within within Vast Network. Okay, Prabhat. Uh, so Prabhat, you work with many customers. Uh, so what kind of security challenges these customers face, and uh, what kind of uh, advice you have given, especially uh, on uh, using social identities? What kind of opportunities you see? Yeah. <coughs> So, uh, so there are two main categories of IAM. So one is the workforce IAM. So where you use it uh, for your internal employees, and then the consumer identity. So where uh, you you uh, expose your business to the rest of the world, and you integrate with your partners, customers, uh, end users. So, uh, so social identity integration. Uh, so it's it's a it's a part of the bring your identity concept, but it's a different uh, different angle and it is it is uh, uh, bit popular in uh, the consumer identity space and people uh, now like uh, thinking to rename this as even IRM identity relationship management uh, so but it, it has its own uh, security risk too uh, because your system is only good as the the strength of the weakest link right so when you expose your system, and if you allow your enterprise identity to be mapped to social identity, then the, the complete strength of your system would as strong as the, the, the strength of the security of the external IDP. So you, you put a lot of weight and uh, trust on the external party. So that really won't happen in enterprise identity space. People won't like let people integrate their social identity. Even, even there are concerns having the same Use a store for the consumer identity and the workforce identity, mm -hmm. uh, but but for like it depends on the uh, the the level of level of security you need for application. If it is like social app, for example, somebody wants to log into uh, uh, log into WSOG and download a white paper, then social identity is perfectly fine, and it will also improve like the sign up process. You don't need to worry about like asking everything from the user, and uh, so it will be very very seamless and smooth. So those things, social integration would happen, uh, but not at the enterprise level. But bringing your identity concept would be there. So if you take, for example, Mobile Connect, right? So Mobile Connect and those other stuff will will be used. Then again, if you if you want to integrate social identity, that that will give an edge and give some flexibility for your users. So think about enabling multi-factor authentication too. So don't just rely on your uh, the, the social uh, IDP. So let your users go there, come back with their uh, social identity, but enforce multi-factor authentication. Let them bring their mobile phone, then you can do MFA, right? Uh, or do uh, email like that. Uh, you can uh, enforce multi-factor authentication from your side. So there are many security measures you can do to achieve your business goals. Okay. Uh, Stefan, so when you talk about uh, the solutions uh, in your slides, uh, you are using several social identities, including Facebook and Gmail. So you well, should have, uh, what's your thoughts and how your customers see this? Well, uh, this is, uh, the idea is um, that the, it's, it's more of a proof of concept phase for the social identity there. Now, I must say, the thing is, they, they want to have a low barrier platform, the customer here. So they really want to have all the options open and they want to really integrate where they need to integrate. But uh, it, it is what it is and, and, and uh, you need a comfortable um, identity uh, uh, solution for the problem at hand. If you look at the other uh, solution I presented for the mobile ID, uh, what the mobile ID company made, that's an entire uh, an entire different area of, 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 of application. They're going to use that for banking applications. 
and uh, for uh, our uh, Belgium EID smart card uh, authentication, which is used by the government. These are other other use cases, and it needs another platform. So uh, social is fine, but it is it it it. it it, it fits uh, hard in the in, in an enterprise uh, environment, I think. Manoj, what's your experience? Uh, yeah, did, I, mean, uh, I, I think I don't think enterprise is ready to, right. uh, to, to at least for our customers. I, I have not seen that. Maybe Google Apps or uh, Google is probably is the closest thing people have been willing to do, right? Mm. To do auth with Google and get access. I think uh, that's the no Facebook or no Twitter or anything else. I think okay. so. I think uh, it's still a long way for the enterprise to adopt that. I think it's okay. yeah. Is there any questions from the customer? Yes. Uh, so what kind of methodologies did you guys use when uh, communicating between systems to systems with the uh, new humans? Mm -hmm. Systems communicating, what kind of security was it? Uh, certificate? Yes, uh, uh, we have been working with Prabha that's been helping us uh, through some of the evaluation. So that's why we were talking about TLS mutual auth certificate to base. That's industry standard, you know. But it comes with its own challenge of certificate rotation and all those things, right? You need to have a, a key management infrastructure that can do that, actually. So we're also trying to use uh, WSO to do service account concept, where you, your app provisions your private key, public key, but you have a footprint of your identity in, uh, plus the public key identity in the uh, WSO2. Those are the two ways, uh, at least, we have been focused on doing that, you know, solving that. So at least um, instead of uh, having to do go to every service and do that, now you have it centralized in one place. So that is the biggest advantage you get basically, right? Everybody is trusting the uh, IDP now basically. Yeah. So Prabhat, uh, so can we use OAuth in this particular situation in order to do system to system integration? Yeah. So so one way of doing with uh, OAuth is to use a uh, client credential grant type. So that is like. So it's similar to username and password, but it identifies a system. Uh, so it doesn't represent the user. It doesn't pass to the user context with the access token when it tries to access an API. Uh, another way is using uh, JWT tokens, JWTs. I think we are doing that with Nutanix too. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, so you can have a key pair. So using JWT based authentication would have the same level of security strength as you are using TLS mutual authentication. So the same like uh, PKI based uh, authentication, you will have a, a key pair of each of your system and then you generate your JWT token, right? And then uh, you authenticate the service. Then, so, so Manoj mentioned that we are working on service accounts. So we have a service account and the service account would have the thumbprint of the public certificate, right? So now the, the JWT is signed from uh, the client to the service and it also would include the, the public key, right? So we validate the JWT token with the embedded public key, get the thumbprint, and then we see whether this thumbprint is that something we trust, right? And the way that we do revocation, we don't need to go to each and every client. So if we just update that service account or remove that thumbprint or update with a new one, then like it, the revocation happens automatically. So the certificate itself has an expiration. The certificate, yes, but if you go with the service account. Yeah, so service, yeah. So service account has credentials attached to that. So if you take uh, uh, OAuth, client ID, and client secret, there will be an expiration to uh, client secret. Uh, so that's something we didn't have before, but if you look at the latest IS530, there's a way of revoking, revoking uh, client secret, and also you can set an expiration time. So yes, so any, any system account, so you need to have a way of like managing. So like some people treat this as like privileged accounts. So privileged accounts are treated in a special manner than the normal use accounts. So is the revocation available in uh, APM 2.2? API Manager 2 should be, uh, API Manager 2, 1, one no should be there. Okay. IS 530. Server can like you know, uh, you know, uh, make use 
Any other questions uh, from audience? Yes. So, Shrinath. at least there's this. Uh, Shrinath, Pranav? Uh. Um, well, I, I see um, machine learning or, or AI sort of helping identity, uh, honestly. Um, I, I think if we can track behaviors from it, uh, from the users, um, based on, on how they log in, how they, they're, they're using these uh, applications, uh, could give much better experience to them. Um, so I would want to see more of that uh, applied uh, out of the boxes in, in many situations where we can uh, apply your technologies like CEP and DAS to really uh, predict the behaviors and do some predictions. Uh, if a person logs in between four and five every day, uh, you can do much more better. Send them text messages or if you can figure out what they're doing between four and five and all that's taking to, uh, logging in and looking at some reports, why not just email those reports to them, right? Um, so uh, I think those kind of applications would, would, would be much more uh, beneficial if you start tracking all of this stuff. Uh, so Prabhat, uh, can you talk a bit about the adaptive authentication uh, sure. and how machine learning and AI can help that? Yeah, yeah, so to add a little more to what uh, Pranav mentioned too, uh, so yes, so like if you look at, I think I mentioned this yesterday during my talk too. Uh, so if you look at all the IAM vendors today, right? Uh, so now we talk like we tell this is the TCP IP moment of identity. So that means like, uh, so some like couple of decades back when we, where you get something, when you buy some software, we worry about whether this software supports a TCP IP stack. And so for some products at that time, it was a competitive advantage, but that's no more, right, today. We never worry about whether the product supports TCP IP stack. So the same thing for IAM products. So we had set of like uh, uh, standards, uh, SAML, OpenID Connect, O, 2O, Scheme, likewise. So now, uh, uh, so all these IAM vendors do support, at least most of the key vendors do support that. So, uh, so it's not something anybody can advertise. It's not any more a competitive advantage. So now we need to worry about building, building uh, on top of that, that's standards and add more value. And if you take uh, digital transformation, the so security is a key concern. Now we open up our perimeter, and for attackers, it's a it's a very broad attack surface. So we need to we need to worry about the security. So the the analytics and big data, and the machine learning. So that's a key aspect in IAM uh, domain, and many vendors coming into that. So one one thing is user user and entity behavior analytics UEBA. So it's it's a term coined by Gartner. It talks about tracking the behavior of users, all the actions user, users do, mostly like internally. So most of the attacks coming from like uh, internal people. Uh, so it can be like uh, consciously done, no unconsciously. Uh, so, so we need to track all, all, everything, right? So IAM would play a key role in getting all this stuff and big data, machine learning, and uh, analytics will help, uh, 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 help to do that in the identity domain. So adaptive authentication, once again, part of that, right? So based on the contextual information, and some people are once again now like trying to get away from passwords and do the authentication totally depending on the behavior, right? So behavior and the access patterns, so adaptive authentication will definitely going to help you. Like the simple example would be like if you keep on uh, log into the system. Uh, so actually, Google does this too. Like if you if you try to log into uh, uh, your YouTube or Gmail from uh, San Jose, keep on logging from there. And if you go to New York and try to log in from there, then it will instead ask you a question. Ask whether for what's which which place you are frequent logging into your system before. Then we need to answer that. And also like uh, like you can uh, based on certain contextual information, you can decide whether to enforce multi-factor authentication or not. So yes, so this is a very key area. So once again, if I talk from WSO to side, so we have a huge strength and huge competitive advantage because we have a complete platform. We have a complete analytics platform, big data platform. 
So, so we are keep on like uh, working on leveraging those functionalities into ad identity uh, management. So you can expect more stuff coming by the end of this year. And that will also give us a huge competitive advantage over all the other IAM vendors. Any comments from Manon? Yeah, so Charles? machine learning, the one simple thing we have done actually is use uh, Google reCAPTCHA. And what Google reCAPTCHA de be uh, does behind the scenes is a lot of machine learning actually. Yeah. Try, to, uh, try to identify you're a bot, you're trying to spurious, uh, making uh, spurious IPs or you know, brute force attacks. Uh, it's a very simple thing which everybody can use actually. The API is free. So we have incorporated that. Um, uh, and also we have done rate limiting uh, on the programming side, on the API side, we try to do rate limiting on the middleware, uh, you know, and then locking the user number of attempts. I think that's a feature of IS. Uh, but talking about attacks, IO, IOT, one of the recent one which stands out to me is maybe not identity related is the Dyn DNS attack, right? Mm -hmm. So the Dyn DNS yes. attack pretty much took the whole of Amazon West out actually. And we had some apps in Hiraku actually. And their DNA, they also didn't have a proper. Now, if you had a secondary DNS, a lot of people would have survived because of it. But it originated from an IoT device, actually. So you can see the threat levels and yes. the attack. Because, you know, it's uh, pretty amazing how people uh, are vulnerable that way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But how would you configure your identity server in a DNS multicast environment? I guess that would be my question. Hmm. No, you could have a read replica in a different region and sync up your DB and an instance there. That's what at least we are planning. We have in two zones in one region, but you could expand it to multi-region, I think, yeah, across US, East, and Europe, and you could do those things, yeah. Okay, so yeah. basically data replication. Yeah, it all depends on your RPO or RTO, right? How much uh, backup and how much data you want to really have in the backup, yeah. Okay. Any other questions from audience? No, okay, cool. Uh, so when selecting a, so a security solution, so uh, each of you, uh, uh, Pranav, Stefan, and Manoj, uh, represent the customer sites, right? Uh, so when you are selecting a security solution, what kind of strategy you are taking and how you find WSO2 or is there any strategy which we had to follow? Uh, what's your thought? Uh, we'll start with uh, Stefan. Well, um, I have... Um been looking for an IDM solution for uh, customer identity management for uh, quite a while. It's a, uh, it's not a very common thing to find, especially in open source. So it's definitely a thing that is, the, the use case it's in, at hand is, is very very particular. That's an important one. Uh, and together with that, uh, if you see the mo the commercial vendors how they approach things are mostly on a user based license model, which if you uh, have a small use case and well, small program and a lot of users, well, it's always a difficult negotiation. So that for um, for many customers that remains uh, a problem uh, um, uh, when moving to to cloud, a usage based model that would be would be would be nice. And that's still it's very scarce in the market uh, as, as a solution. Um, and I think. Uh, I've, d I've done a project five years ago using Active Directory and, and a traditional identity management for customer identity management. Well, what I've learned there is it's a different story. It's not the same thing. Uh, traditional policies doesn't work in that conditions because yeah, you can't do a password expiration after six months if you have a user that only logs on once a year. So you need the intelligence to adapt to the situation and be a bit smarter about that. Um, and also, what uh, I think is very important for the for the future, if you see identity management becoming this important and really a business enabler, and yeah, with the I got an app for that mentality that's been going on where we put our our effort in a lot of applications, uh, being able to keep up to speed with all those uh, identity integrations, that would be a tremendous effort, and I see. Uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, identity as a service, identity management as a service, being able to provide an up-to-date integration with the major vendors, with the major tools that everybody uses, that, that is a very necessary thing, I think. Doing it on your own for smaller customers, it won't be, it won't be manageable. That is a very important one for the future, I think, to, to move into. 
Yeah, so I think uh, we came to WSOCon two years back, you know, as a prospect. Uh, so we didn't know what the product could do or anything, basically. Probably half the crowd or less than half the crowd, I think, two, two years back, right? So we were introduced by somebody else introduced us, say, take a look at it. Uh, not many vendors in the market, if you think about it, what is Okta, Ping Identity are one of the bigger players, I think, right? Um, Non-open source version of the product. And we, we did a basic comparison, right? We liked what we saw in the product. Um, we spoke to a few of your customers, GE and uh, a few of the big customers, I think, their experience. So, and plus, I think we felt the open source was a key aspect for us, right? A product which is open source and extensibility, I think, proper. Standard protocols are now supported by, I think, if you can write, write customizers an ex extension on a product, uh, helps you make decisions faster and move things faster. I think th those were some of the key things we liked about the product. Uh, of course, we didn't know the product will scale or not. I was always skeptical because it open source, we put it there. But the good thing is it has gone from 1,000 to 100,000 users. I think it scaled pretty well. So overall happy about that, I think, yeah, the process. Yeah, so many companies do the strategy is either uh, you know, strategies buy this biggest identity provider or you know, the solution out there, pay a lot of dollars for it. Or uh, buy the one or, or invest in one that integrates nicely with your, with your uh, solutions. Um, you know, there are a lot of products out there that you pay a lot of top dollars for, but may not, may not integrate nicely. You still have to invest a lot to get it to working with, with the way you want it. Um, I think uh, for us, we have been using WSU stack for a while. Uh, so adding uh, another product on top of it was a, or a natural choice. Being open source and extensible. Uh, a lot of the things Manoj and Stefan mentioned about scalability and, and, and being able to uh, support different protocols and stuff was, was really what, what drove us to, to using it. Okay. Uh, so all three mentioned about the open source, so it triggered me. Uh, so open source, uh, again, one of the misconception from the people is uh, uh, there's a security problem with open source. Uh, I, I would like to say it as uh, security by obscurity. If you don't put the source out, yes, the issue is there, but nobody knows about the issue. So you feel secured, right? So Stefan and Manoj, uh, so Manoj, you are uh, putting it, uh, you, you are building a software which other end users are going to use. Uh, Stefan, uh, you are representing customers, or you are taking WSO2 products to your customers. Uh, then uh, uh, Pranav, also you are using WSO2 products there. Do you see, do you get any questions from the customers about since you are using an open source project or since you are putting an open source solution to the customers, they feel they are less secured because other attackers can read the code and understand and attack you? When I can go. Uh, so even our core product, we use a lot of open source. The Nutanix as a company use Uku, a lot of Apache licensed open source. I think the key is to be staying on top of it, uh, making sure software is updated in a freaking uh, in regular manner, I think. And also making sure there's a good community around the uh, open source, you know. Uh, those are the keys. So otherwise, I mean, most of the, I would say most of the startups in the valley, 90% uses open source, right? Hardly people develop everything from ground up, actually. Right, uh, so yeah, okay. I don't see it as a big issue. Yeah, okay. Stefan. Well, um, uh, I, I, from time to time, I look at uh, other people's code, and I wouldn't worry about WSO2 uh, being not secure because uh, if you see programming practices and, 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 and cross site scripting uh, uh, practices and stuff like that, uh, that is not the main concern. Um, the thing is, uh, we use two, two well, in the Microsoft stack, we use uh, Think Texture, and, and for, for the more Java clients, we have uh, uh, WSO2. I think it's important uh, to give trust uh, on, on the level of, of maturity of the product by able to uh, show other customers uh, that, that are using the product. And if you see the use cases and the customers that are using WSO2, in a sense that gives some confidence on, 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 on the level of, uh, of, of, of effort that's put in there to get it secured, because nothing is secured out of the box. It, it's just uh, uh, enough, there mu must be enough interest to secure it uh, all the time. So I think that is the, the biggest thing that, that is, that's going around open source in a sense. It's not discussion anymore, it's, it's, it's the default. Uh, so that's a very good thing, very happy about that. Okay, good. Any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, 
if I go with the next questions. Okay, cool. Uh, so Prabhat, uh, the next question is for you. So I know you are interested in blockchain. Um, so we have a keynote coming uh, next on the blockchain as well. But you started learning about blockchain and so on. You, uh, again, Gartner put blockchain as one of the rising technology within identity space. So what kind of stuff we can do with the blockchain, uh, especially on the identity and access management cases? Sure. <coughs> So something uh, we talk later blockchain is the, the self-sovereign identity. So now let's say like, so we rely on like uh, centralized uh, entities to manage our identity. So we have our uh, identity with Facebook. So if Facebook is down, so our identity is gone. And, and uh, so if there are many other service providers or reliant parties that depend on Facebook, identity cannot function anymore. So Google, same thing. So we, we rely like there are mil millions of identities with uh, Google and billions at Facebook. And governments do that too, right? So in the, India has this Aadhaar project. So government has a total control of your identity. So if they can, if they want to block us, like so I use Aadhaar identity to access my bank. So if they want to cut down my access to bank, then they can centrally cut it down. I cannot vote or I can do anything. So European governments, uh, they have their own identity management system. Then Canada is working on their own uh, like uh, government control identity management systems. So government is gaining more control. So this same thing, like so even we think DNS decentralized. So big countries, they have control over that. So that's what happened to WikiLeaks, right? So if government thinks, OK, we need to cut this down, they can simply do that. So that's why now people worry about that and think about self-sovereign identity. So what happens with blockchain is, so blockchain is a distributed ledger and also we support with uh, 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 its own consensus protocol, right? So people use block, the, the mechanism, uh, the, the technology where the blockchain is built to build a self-sovereign identity model. So a few things that you can look at is uh, the block stack and then again uh, uh, shoe card and uh, name coin. So what they do is they let you control your identity, right? So so you uh, so there are different approaches. Blockstack Blockstack basically uh, create a name for you and get the hash of the name and then write that hash to the uh, blockchain. But they build another virtual layer of uh, name service on top of that to maintain your profile data. Uh, so uh, for uh, shoe shoe card they write everything to blockchain. So likewise, they give the control of your identity to you. Now let's say I have my information in my uh, in my uh, uh, in blockchain, which is uh, which is controlled by my private key and public key. Now it's self-asserted identity, right? It's given by me. Now I go go to DMV, right? So so DMV would have its private key and public key in blockchain, and I give my public key, blockchain public key, so they can physically or somehow verify my identity and they can assert that identity. So anybody looking at my identity blockchain would know this is asserted by DMV. So anybody would trust DMV would know that. But DMV cannot like do any changes to my identity attributes. I own that. And DMV doesn't need to be like in existence to validate this one. So the whole concept behind the, the blockchain identity is to uh, build a self-sovereign identity model. So Microsoft right now working with uh, uh, block stack to build the identity model uh, based on blockchain, uh, but still all these are like very like initial level research at the moment. Okay. So, so we have one more minute. Uh, if you want, we can take one custom uh, one uh, question from the audience. Uh, any final questions from the audience? Uh, yes, three hands. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's that's a concern. That that once again, uh, so the slowness in blockchain comes from the distributed consensus protocol that they have built in. Like they are unnecessary. Come up with the hard challenge, right? So you need to solve that hard challenge. So that is basically uh, so the the way the the way the blockchain handled this is. Uh, through giving an incentive for good people, right? 
So even in even in bit, Bitcoin, like if the 50 more than 51 percent of mining servers are owned by bad people, then system will fail, right? So this is this incentive is the one which solves many of the issues in blockchain. But then again, that has caused this slowness, right? So so some of this. So once again, as I mentioned, this identity in blockchain is still at the preliminary stage. So uh, so yes, so it will have issue with the number of transactions. Like whenever I announce a name, that has to be written to blockchain, and it, it can handle like about seven, eight transactions per minute. It's a very low number. So they need to come up with a different model, model on top of that to solve those issues. Still, those things are going on research. Like to make this production, yes. So those things need to be resolved. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Pranav, Stefan, and Manoj, and Prabhat, uh, for giving interesting comments and uh, contributing to this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.